Ethan, I saved an absolutely atrocious week in biathlon fantasy. Uh, I, I went a little risky on the individual. I, I kind of went with some people who I thought were going to have like really good shooting performances and, and stun the world. Um, it started out with Eustace Strello having three misses <laughs> in his first prone. And then also uh, Yakov Fak not even racing. Um, and then my women just weren't skiing well and with the wind weren't hitting the target. So it almost was a terrible week, but uh, saved it with a really dominant mass start. How about you? Kind of the same story for me and the individual. Um picked Nicholas Hartvag. Turns out he didn't race just like Jakob Fack. And then, <laughs> you know, didn't quite nail the relays. And then the mass starts, you know, were okay. Not great, but better weekend than ones I've had in the past. That's for sure. I think this is the first time I've picked someone who ended up not starting. And that was just completely my bad. So I don't deserve to get the points, I think. <laughs> yeah, it happens. It happens. All right, that's it for the second trimester, and we're back, ladies and gentlemen, with the Brian and Ethan Biathlon Podcast. First, I want to give a huge shout out to everyone who went and reviewed our uh, our podcast. Ethan, I think uh, before I mentioned your, or asked for a review, we had like one review on Spotify. Now we have eight, and our current rating is 4.8. So shout out to those seven people who gave us a five-star review or hopefully a five-star review. Um, but there's another podcast out there, English-speaking podcast that covers biathlon, not going to name names, but there's another podcast out there that has 20 reviews. So we're kind of coming up hot on them, and I want to see if we can we can dethrone them in the review category. <laughs> That's just my competitive side kicking in. But yeah, thanks to everyone who sent us a review and kept the conversation going on YouTube. But yeah. So I'm exciting biathlon to finish out the uh, trimester, Ethan. Always beautiful in Anholtz, beautiful venue to um, finish out the trimester and go into the break before World Champs. But uh, actually, Anholtz didn't start with great weather. A little foggy and windy for the individuals. I think this was the first race I can you know remember for a long time in Anholtz that wasn't beautiful and sunny with you know this mountains covered in snow like we saw for the later part of the weekend but it was interesting to see some kind of oberhof type conditions at the beginning of the week and then definitely affected the the races i know we're going to talk about that later but it's always good to watch some races in Antolts. yeah absolutely beautiful venue and the crowd turned out i mean absolutely mm -hmm. great crowd turnout which uh, is always great mm -hmm. All right, hands down for me, the story of the week was Lena Heike Gross getting her first win on the World Cup after having two podiums, uh, yeah, two previous podiums, one just a couple weeks prior in Hockfeldson, uh, gets her first win of her career. And honestly, Ethan, I almost feel like it was just a matter of time. You know what I mean? Oh, for sure. I mean, she's been on the World Cup since 2014 which is at this point almost 10 years ago. Um, she's still 28, so she's not by no means, you know, towards the end of her career. She still has a few more years where she could be competing at the the highest level. But to, she has four career World Cup podiums, and to see half of those come in one weekend, I'm sure she must be over the moon, especially this being the last World Cup before World Champs. But it was definitely... You know, we could all see this coming at some point. We were just waiting for her to put together the perfect day. Um, she definitely had to shoot clean in whatever race she ended up winning, just because her ski speed isn't isn't up there with the fastest. It's by no means bad, but it's you know, it's not her strength per se. Um, but yeah, for her to shoot clean and put it all together is awesome to see. Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, she's had a huge step up in in shooting this year. I, I'm kind of looking at her stats right now. I really haven't gone into her her, her data. Okay. <laughs> Huge step up in shooting. Uh, last season, shooting 79%. 
this year currently shooting 87 percent so that's a that's a huge step up doing quick math off the top of my head looks like about nine nine uh nine eight percent increase um <laughs> but a uh, huge step up in shooting and her ski speed as well uh minus two last year to minus four so that puts her in like the elite level yeah not as fast as like a uh, Justine Brezat Boucher or uh, Elvira Oberg, but still up there with the best of them. And yeah, her 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 progression chart on Real Biathlon is just going up and to the right, and that's what you want to see, um, which is really cool. It, it, you know, it, it's interesting because no, I don't think she has the you know that ski speed that makes her like an automatic favorite, kind of like you mentioned. But Lena Hecke has fight, and I think. She has it. Tandervold has it. There's a couple athletes out there that when you watch them ski, they just have fight. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. For sure. And, you know, for someone um, to bring up that some of our listeners might be a little more familiar with is like Jesse Diggins on the cross country world cup. Yeah. They're always going to give it everything they have every race, whether they're fighting for the podium, fighting for a top 10, even fighting just to get world cup points. They're going to give it everything they have every single day. Yeah, it's uh, it, it's really cool because, like, I, you know, Lena's like the she's the kind of person that you want on your leg four of the relay. You know, she's not she's not the ice man like uh, Christensen where you know she's gonna guarantee bring home. But if it comes down to a fight between you and your team and another athlete, you want Lena on your team. And even if she has a miss or something or she needs to use some spares, she's gonna fight. And it, it almost makes up for maybe that lack of, of ski speed um, because it can, it can sort of manifest, manifest itself as uh, a little bit more like tactical, you know, um, a little bit more uh, like pushing over the top and, and pushing uh, through the hard sections of the course um, where, you know, someone who has just outright ski speed might just, you know, just be a faster skier in certain spots, but for Lena to, to really give it when it, when it means, uh, when it means something I think is, is really cool. But yeah, I, I don't know. I, I think Lena Hecky Gross is like one of the, she kind of reminds me a little bit of like Lowell Bailey, you know, when, when, when he won his medal at world champs, everyone on the scene was super excited for him. And it seems to be the same way for Lena Hecky Gross. She's just uh, super, super nice. Switzerland is, you know, they're great by athletes, but they're not dominant by any means. They're not you know, one of the powerhouse nations. So it's really cool to see another nation on top of the podium. Um, and so I think it's just really cool. And she even mentioned in her post-race, her post-race press conference interview um, in, in both her win and the race, the mass start where she got third, she just was so thankful that everyone was showing so much love and support, all the other biathletes on the scene. So it just kind of goes to show you that, you know, it, it's a small biathlon community. The biathlon family is very much alive and well. And yeah, people people were excited for Lena. It's, it's really cool. All right. Unfortunately, little miss here. Sebastian Samuelson did not have a good week, Ethan. He was he was in there like kind of on the cusp of being able to fight with the Norwegians up at the top of the field, but not after this weekend. Not not so great. No, definitely not. And he wasn't even in the uh, first race of the week in the individual. He wasn't even top four for sweden he was the fifth swede i believe in 59th place with seven misses that's not even scoring points because the points only go down to 40 so that's that that's the kind of race that's going to kick you out of the fight for the overall you know what i mean Mm -hmm. and i don't know how you know if he was really in that fight coming into this weekend having gotten sick and not really performed up to his his best in recent weekends but we're all everyone i think in the bathroom world is rooting for him we all want to see him succeed and do well but just not really putting it together as of late yeah i mean i i i like uh i'm trying to just figure out real quick how many people passed him it looks like at least three or four people passed him this weekend with a pretty terrible performance um 
you know, I, I like Ponce Loma. I like Benny Dole. I like Johannes Kuhn. I really like Jacamel. But I just don't feel like any of those guys have what it takes to fight against, you know, the Norwegians who are just <laughs> dominating the top six. Ponce Loma is the closest non-Norwegian in there. Uh, he's pretty far back of Ligrid, um and well behind, you know, the top three. But I, I'm just not as confident in Ponce Loma's shooting ability to be able to crack that top six. Uh, Dole seems to just be going backwards. His shooting percentage is <laughs> left the building. Um, and yeah, with Seb falling down in the rankings this weekend now, after already missing a couple of races because of COVID early in the season, now missing the points here. I Unfortunately, I think that's going to be, that's going to do it for him at least in the fight for the overall. I mean, not that I think he was going to be able to come back out of nowhere and take the crown, but I think he he really needed to have a dominant weekend this weekend in order to stay in the hunt for like maybe the top three. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm, for sure. And maybe he was just trying to rest up and train through um, this middle trimester after being sick and to get ready for world champs. But you know, there's no overall points up for grabs at world champs, which, you know, we've talked about in the previous episodes. We aren't totally on board with, but he's not going to be able to gain points in Nova Mesto. And that only leaves the final trimester. Um, so I think the question now is, does he even come to North America for the last two world cups or just hang out in Europe and train and you know live his life? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I, I don't see any reason why he wouldn't. He, actually, he better come because we're supposed to meet up in Soldier Hollow and he's going to give me a bib uh, <laughs> for the winner of my fantasy <laughs> league. So he better come to North America. But, um, you know, I, I don't see any reason why he wouldn't skip. Why, or, I'm sorry. I, I don't see any reason why he would skip the last uh, cut North American stages. But I think for right now, he's just kind of fighting for like the best of the rest um, as, as you might say. Um, and, and, you know, honestly, he probably, especially after losing uh, a couple of races due to COVID earlier in the season, he probably shifted his focus to the world championships pretty early on. And so for him, it probably doesn't, he's probably not too concerned about the overall at this point. Um, he's probably really just focusing on the world champs. And, and honestly, I, I still like him at the world champs. I think Sebastian, Samuelson at his best could be the best biathlete in the world, hands down. And so on the right day, good shooting, fast skiing. There's no reason why he can't come out of world champs with a medal haul like he did. Well, honestly, like he did last year. Um, so I, I still like him for that, but unfortunately he's just a little too far out for, you know, fighting, fighting for that overall now. Um, anyone else from seven to 15, like Jacqueline Dole, uh, Ponsaloma, Gio- Giacomel, anyone else you think can crack that Norwegian top six? I mean, Ligrid, to me, Ligrid's looking vulnerable. <laughs> I I agree. Ligrid is, you know, in the hot seat a little bit there, sitting at sixth, but I expect him to kind of turn his season around, especially with world champs and then his home World Cup in Oslo. I'm sure he's got to be looking forward to that. But none of those athletes really give me the confidence, you know, on the range and putting it together on the skis consistently enough. Maybe Benedict Dole, just because we've seen him break up that Norwegian dominance before. And, you know, he's definitely going to have to hit some more targets than he has been in the recent weekends. But I don't know if Ligrid turns it around, figures, figures it out a little bit. It's looking kind of tough for anyone to break that Norwegian one through six at the top. Yeah, I agree. All right, let's turn this thing around. We had, uh, okay, Seb, not a great weekend, but that's too bad. We actually saw some absolutely dominant performances this last weekend. And, you know, I think the Rupe holding week was exciting because it was just like, you know, nose to the grindstone racing, just head to head battle. This weekend was actually kind of exciting as well because of the absolute dominance. And it wasn't dominance from one athlete because we've seen that in the last couple of years. And quite frankly, that's like 
that's like not fun. <laughs> but dominance across the board is kind of interesting. And this is one of the first weekends I think we've seen this in the last couple of years. First, it starts off with Johannes Tingisbo cleaning the individual under terrible conditions, dominating the individual. Germany dominated the single mixed relay. Uh, Simone in the mass start, that looked like, to me, it was a dominant performance. And then also Johannes Dale, even though he came in second overall, again, he just, like, you could see the fear in all the other skiers' eyes on the last lap when Johannes Dale, you know, when you realize that Johannes Dale is near you. <laughs> um, so I guess let, let's break down some of these dominant performances. Uh, I guess we'll go in chronological order here. Johannes Tingis cleaning the the individual. Did you have that on your bingo card? Because, I mean, he's been good this year, but it definitely the shooting had been the biggest uh, the biggest weakness, at least from my perspective in his performance. Mm-hmm. I totally agree, and I think given how foggy it was and how difficult the shooting appeared to be for the typical athletes, we would peg to be good shooters. Um. I was really not expecting Johannes Tingisbo to win this, but being able to ski as fast as he is, that confidence that he has that he can win any single race that he enters, maybe might not be as high this year as it has in previous years, but he's still that guy in biathlon. And I think he really proved that um, this weekend in the individual by winning by a minute and 36 seconds over his brother, <laughs> who was, you know, the time gaps in this race were ginormous. Um, who knows what that's down to, if that's down to the, the weather, the shooting conditions, whatever, a lot of the, uh, commentators on Eurovision were talking how slow the, the snow was just because of how wet with the fog, um, mm-hmm. and with the whole wax protocol yeah, standardization the that the lack of fluoros and how important that structure of your ski is, you know, if you choose the wrong ski on a day like that, you know, you're losing five to ten percent every single lap you know on the extreme and that could ruin your race even if you shoot clean you know you might not even have a chance so it was a very interesting race but it was really awesome to see johannes Johannes tingis bow winning by a big margin again yeah and i mean this is this was the type of performance that i think we all kind of expected this year um with how dominant he was last year um second fastest course time behind Johannes Dahle. And oh, take a look at this. Lukas Hoffer was third fastest course time. That's kind of interesting. Um, but yeah, it, it was cool. And like looking at the shooting scores here, uh, one other clean device. Yeah, one other clean. George Buda from Romania, but he finished in 22nd due to yeah, probably not having the best ski performances here. The best ski um, selection maybe, but uh yeah lots of ones and twos and so um yeah kind of wild to see the, the the gaps in the time as well i mean yeah a minute 30 up on his brother and then the top 10 separated by almost three minutes top 30 by 351 that's that's crazy in the top 60 602 if this was a sprint and the top 60 were separated by 602 the those guys would still be shooting prone as the leaders were coming in for their next <laughs> for their next uh they'd be anxious they'd be leaving the stadium as the leaders were coming in for their first shooting <laughs> but yeah pretty cool to see uh johannes ting is stepping it up right as we're entering world champs time and you know the going gets tough um but then the next day uh germany in the single mixed relay uh you know, looking at this team of Vote and Strello, I mean, both great athletes, great shooters. I had Strello in the individual. I had Vote in the in the first individual of the season. Both let me down. But I did not think this was going to be a good single mixed relay team, Ethan, because, you know, the single mixed relay to me is like, like fast paced, shoot quick. Yes, hit your targets, but shoot quick, ski fast. You want a fast twitch person. You want a you want a, a quick mover like Campbell, right? Honestly, he he gives me single mix relay vibes. Um, but yeah, Germany dominates them with missing one target, one target out of forty to uh, 
yeah, to take the win over Norway. It was definitely not the uh, the athlete combination like you talked about that we would have predicted to perform this well, but you know, this just goes to show how important the shooting is, shooting aspect of the sport is, and if you can master that, you know, the sky is the limit on any given day. Um, but for them to go into Antolts, and although Italy did not put out their potential A team for the single mixed relay, but there are definitely tons of competitive nations out there. And this, I don't think is Germany's A team either for a single mixed relay, but for them to do that in Antolts right before world champs, you know, is going to leave the German coaches, you know, with a decision to make for who to race and what relays and what races come Nova Mesto. Um, but it would have been so cool if, Strello had cleaned his his standing and they would have hit every single target because that's never happened before in a single mixed relay but we'll just have to keep waiting on that one yeah and, and even with Italy not putting their their A team out there I mean they came in fourth only 37 mm-hmm. back 10 seconds out of third and they had a penalty loop uh, not bad same thing with Latvia only 10 seconds out of third place and a penalty loop uh, France I mean Jacqueline Oof, don't get us started on him. Two penalty loops. <laughs> Not good. Um, but also the U.S. And we said this last time with the U.S. Uh, men's relay team. I'll say it for the this mixed relay team as well, I think, because I think a team of Irwin and Wright, like that's that's a pretty good team. Two penalty loops. Uh, Deidre had one in her second prone, and Campbell had one in his second standing. But look at all the other shooting stages. Zero plus one. Zero 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 zero. I, I we said it last time, I'm gonna say it about this relay team as well. I think we're just peaking at the right time. <laughs> it's gonna come mm-hmm. together, we're gonna to put together a full performance where there's no penalty loops and it's I, I, fingers crossed, it's coming at the right time and we're gonna see we're gonna see what these teams are capable of. I, I think it's coming. Um mm-hmm. but yeah, then Simone in the mass start, one miss out of 20 shots um you know she didn't beat Lou Jomino by too terribly much but after like that first prone I I I just kind of got this feeling I Simone wasn't going to lose this race I could just kind of tell um that just the way she commanded herself her presence in the in the group on the range um Simone just did not seem like she was going to uh to lose this one um, is this an example of someone who's, you know, finding their stride right at the right time as well? I mean, last year she was super dominant and definitely has not been the Simone of, of last season, yesteryear. <laughs> mm-hmm. yeah, her, her ski speed is down relatively compared to the top 10 athletes, which you know, I think you can kind of tell with your eye test about how she's been doing this year. But you're right. She did kind of have that aura of, you know, I'm in control. I'm going to go out, win this race, no matter what Lou Jean Monod did, Julia Simone still felt like she was going to win that race. And she led basically every single time check after the first shooting. And, you know, didn't seem like she was really worried to look back or was too flustered at any point. And it was just an all around super solid full race of biathlon that she, you know, missed one target. She can afford to do that, um, especially at an Antolts at altitude where other athletes are also struggling, missing some targets that they might not normally miss. But it was a great race and good to see her back on the top of the podium. Yeah. And, and it was kind of cool too. Like I did a little analysis of Simone's season last year and, you know, kind of where she came from because she like really came out of nowhere last season. Um, and I was just you know, trying to figure out like what, where, who, where'd she come from? And like one, one statistical interesting thing that I discovered about her performance last year was a, she really stepped up her shooting speed, um, which, you know, like that's not going to make or break your performance, um, might save you a couple seconds here and there, but what she also was able to do was she improved her shooting percentage. And then in head-to-head racing, like the mass starts, the pursuits, relays, et cetera, head-to-head racing, her shooting percentage was even better and still fast, um, much faster than, you know, a couple seasons ago. So that ability for her to, like, 
shoot super fast and hit the target like that's really intimidating when you're standing on the on the range next to her and definitely hats off to Lou Jamino who like she even said in her pre her post race interview like yeah I know that Simone's going to shoot faster than me I'm just going to do my own thing and I'm just going to have my own race and like if you're a young racer out there there's loads and loads and loads of inspiration that you can get just from that one sentence but um you know no going back to to Julia Simone like that that's kind of the dominance that I like to see it. It's a different type of dominance than like Forcade or what Dale is doing right now on the skis, which we'll talk about in a second. It's like range dominance. It's like, you want to play? Then come on, stay with me. Like you think you, you think you can compete with me? Watch this and just nails the targets. And it, it's funny because Doro has done this for a long time. She's always been a fast uh, shooter and a good, a good shooter. But there's just something about the way that Julia Simon also carries herself that she cocky is not the right word, but competitive. I definitely get way more competitive vibes from Julia Simone than I ever did with Doro. So I don't know. It's, 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 it's kind of, it's kind of fun to watch in my opinion. Um, but yeah. And then, like I said, Dale on the skis, I mean, man, <laughs> did, I, I kind of feel like, all right. I kind of knew, I don't think anyone thought that VB or Sorum was going to beat Dale on the last lap. I think everyone's kind of like, oh, Dale's going to get third. Sorum's coming in fourth. But the attack that Dale put in on that last climb, that, I mean, talk about race strategy here. The attack that he put out on that last climb was so freaking good that his momentum over the top carried him right up to feel my on a downhill. On a downhill. He didn't even have to push or do anything. He put, he put the attack in a K ago, and he's still reaping the rewards from that. Now, granted, I think... Uh, uh, Fiume's skis were pretty trash. And I think I, I saw an article today that even Simone Forcade, his coach, apologized to him. Uh, and the staff, the WAC staff apologized to him because I think everyone in the French organization was like, you should have come in second. Um, and your skis just let you down. But I mean, I mean, you tell, you tell young kids when you're racing, hey, you got to push up over the top because it makes a difference on the downhill you can't get a more clear example of Johannes Dale closing. What was that? hundred meters on one downhill, just because he put in a sprint. That's crazy. I, I, I mean, we all knew Dale was good on the last lap, but uh, this is, I think these, this week and then Rupe holding, those were the last two weeks. Uh, the last, the, the, the most prominent examples of his absolute dominance. Mm-hmm. It's, you know, we talk about how fast Dale is and, how fast Johannes Tingus Bo are. And it almost feels like they're a very different kind of fast, if you know what I mean, where Dolly can put in that burst, you know, still having put in a top three ski time for the whole race, put in that burst and just you know, absolutely leave you in the dust, regardless of who you are. And then Johannes Tingus Bo can just sustain such a high speed for the entire race. He's never, never going to win a sprint to the finish line against a lot of the world cup athletes, but the pace he can sustain for a whole race is just unbelievable. Watching Dale be able to put in these bursts, whether it's a pursuit and roof holding last weekend or the mass start here in on you know, it's just so fun to watch and it's kind of a different, firework that biathlon now has you know looking at his ski times throughout the year the slowest ski time he's had is sixth overall and there's a couple fours a couple threes but there's a lot of ones and a lot of twos in his overall ski rank this year which is way up from what he was doing in previous seasons and you know whatever he did this summer clearly is working pretty good All right, something a little interesting here. Um, so a couple weeks ago in Oberhof, we had uh, Jeanine Richard, who is the current IBU Cup overall leader. And I think she's still currently the leader at the moment. Um, she has been on the World Cup the last couple of weeks, but I think she's still a leader. Jeanine Richard comes in, places top 10 in her first ever um, World Cup race. 
this week we had Danilo Rettmuller, who got the call in the morning that one of the Germans was sick and they could start him on the World Cup if he could just get to Anholtz. He was in Germany. If he could just get to Anholtz, he can get on the start line. Um, he does that. And what, what did he place? Do you know it off the top of your head? Uh, he got seventh in the individual. Another top 10. Seventh in the individual. Um, qualified for the mass start, 24th. Not great prone shooting. But, um, like, yeah, you have you have these athletes. Uh, you have Vabjorn Sorum who just simply because he does not have a spot on the World Cup team because Norway is so dominant, is stuck on the IBU Cup, murdering the IBU Cup, gets one spot on the on the uh, start line for the mass start because he's technically ranked in the top 25, so he is entitled to a start spot. Comes in fourth. <laughs> uh, I mean, we've... I, biathlon, people like, you know, coaches and athletes who are, like, deep in the biathlon... We've known for some years now that you know the top athlete on the IBU Cup is they they will be competitive on the World Cup. That's that's been known for a couple seasons now, but it seems like this year there there's even a step up from that. It, it's like it not like you're guaranteed a top ten, but the fact that they're these these athletes are jumping up and doing so well, like seventh place that's that's crazy good that's that's as good as lena hecky gross on you know a a good race that's as good as uh sebastian samuelson if you if i said hey seb came in seventh today you'd be like "Eh, that's fine like wanted wanted the podium but he should be happy with seventh and jacamel yeah he should be happy with seventh but this is danilo reitmuller he's a ibu cup guy this is Vebjorn Sorm. There, he's an IBU. What are what are these IBU Cup people doing in the top ten? It just goes to show you the depth in biathlon right now, Ethan. Mm-hmm. And obviously, the depth in biathlon is going to come from the teams at the top, and we see that with France, Germany, and Norway, and these three athletes. But like you said, we we know they can come in and you know hold their own. Maybe you know, most likely get World Cup points. Maybe you know crack the top fifteen, top twenty. But for Sorum to come back to the World Cup, get third, and Wright Mueller to get seventh, and um, Jean Richard, you know, hold her own. She was by no means off the pace. She was competitive still. She's you know, not quite at that level. She's still only 21, which I believe still makes her a junior. But yep. you know, it's so awesome to see these athletes take the chances that they're given to compete show what they can do and gosh as far as coaching uh coaches going into world champs i really do not envy any of the norwegian german or french coaches having to make decisions on who gets what start spots and it seems like it's going to be a mess but it's so awesome to see these ibu cup guys performing well and if you're an athlete on the IBU Cup competing against these guys pretty much every weekend, you got to feel good about where you're at and what you what you are capable of, regardless of you know, you're on the IBU Cup just like these guys are, and you can easily trans- translate that skill to the to the World Cup. It seems like. Yeah, and, and it's really cool. Another thing is like, I mean, we kind of saw a little bit of a fumbling of the bag with Yano Love Boten <laughs> when he got his start. He, yeah. Oh man, like false started, had a terrible <laughs> like shooting. Stay. It was just not good. But I mean, also too like this is a little like insider biathlon, but it's like you see these athletes come up and perform right away. There's no like. Oh, I'm just nervous. Like, yeah, I, I had one of my worst shooting days of the season. Like, yeah, it's okay. It's just your first day on in the big leagues. Like, it'll happen to everyone. Just gain experience. It's like, no. Mm-hmm. Good biathletes are good biathletes. Like, you show up. It doesn't matter if you're in Martell on the IBU Cup or if you're in Anholtz on the World Cup in front of 50,000, 100,000 spectators, in front of millions of people on TV. Like, you do your job. And you perform. And if that means it's second place in Martell or it's second place in the World Cup, like 
it doesn't matter. You do your job, hit your targets, ski fast. And it, I don't know that it, that's just really, for me, that's the most impressive thing is it's, it's, uh, the ability to perform when you get that one shot and it's, and it's almost not even like, I, I almost feel like I'm saying it wrong. It's not the ability to perform. It's not like a superpower. It's you just do your job. And once you can, as an athlete, shift your mindset from like spectating your own race or spectating your own performance to actively doing your job, that's what, that's the difference between an elite biathlete and someone who just has like talent. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it's, it's just so awesome to see them do this. And hopefully we see more, more of this with other nations and other athletes, but start spots limiting who's able to start in the world cup is obviously in Sorum's case and uh, Wright Mueller's case, not ideal. But all they have to do is you know, they've shown they can compete with you know, the best in the world, let alone the best g- athletes on their own nation. You know, maybe we'll see these guys as regulars in the World Cup next year or a couple of years, but it's always good to see an, an IBU Cup athlete come in and perform well. Yeah. Did you see Sorum's post-race interview after the mass start? I did not. It, it was kind of funny. It's like a little, a little ho-hum. He's just like, yeah, I really wish that my team had more start spots. And then the, the interviewer's like, oh, well, you did great, though. He's like, yeah, I, I just got to do what I got to do when I have the opportunity. It's tough to be Norwegian. And it's like, dude, you just came on the podium. Like, <laughs> come on, man. <laughs> like, Yeah, I don't know. It's got to be tough. Yeah, but understandable. Yep. Ethan, it's World Champs time. We're going to we're, where is where is it? No, we're going to Nova Mesto. <laughs> I almost forgot there for a second. Um, well, yeah, you know, we're going to Nova Mesto. Personally, I love Nova Mesto. It's my favorite venue. Uh, I fell in love when they had the World Champs there in 2013, and their Biathlon Stadium looked like a freaking college football bowl game. Um, it's awesome. It's loud. Uh, the checks are passionate about biathlon. I think it's a great venue for world champs and I want to make some predictions, but I don't want to just go race by race and say, who do you think is going to win this race? Cause that's, as we can tell with fantasy biathlon, that's really hard. And also it's like, anyone can just go back and look at, you know, the sprints from the last couple of seasons or the last couple of weeks and, you know, come to some relatively good conclusion on what they think is going to happen. Um, but I want to go, I, I got three questions for you and we can explore mm-hmm. these. First one, we'll start with how many wins is Johannes Tingus bow going to get? And you can include relays in there. You can include, um, yeah, whatever you want in there. But in total, it looks like we he would have potentially, if he started every event, two, three, four, five, six, seven events. So mm-hmm. World Cup overall leader, number one, Johannes Tingus bow How many wins do you think he's walking away with? This is a tough question because I definitely don't have the confidence in him as you know coming into World Champs his previous years. I think not counting relays, just going off all the individual races, I think I, he might only get one. You know, I'm a, you know, if I had to put my bet on one, it'd probably be the sprint or the pursuit, um, including relays. I'm assuming Norway's probably going to win the mixed relay. I would be willing to put a lot of money on them winning the men's relay. Um, whether or not he, he actually races the single mixed relay, I think is a valid question just because it's right after the um, tw- 20K. It's kind of <laughs> towards the end of the week. Um, I think Norway can put any of those top six guys in there and feel confident that they have a chance of winning. So I wouldn't be surprised if he sits that race out. Um, I would say, with including relays, I'm going to put him at three. What about you? I, I really like that. I'm I'm also going to put him at three. Um, I actually I'll put him at four because I, I think he will race the the single mixed relay. 
Um, I'll put him at four, but I, I, I do agree. I don't think he's going to have that dominance that he had last season um, where he cleaned up at world champs and then also the Olympics the, the year before that. Um, and yeah, he just doesn't seem as, as sure thing this year. Like, yeah, he's leading in the overall, but if you look at his performance through the season, um, I'm just trying to pull up his results real quick. If you look at his performance through the season. I mean, yeah, he's had a, he's had a four wins, but he's also had a ton of top fives. Like his worst race is, is 18th to start the season um a 15th and then just a ton of top 10 so it really seems like the reason he's winning this year is because his he's um he's averaging or he's like a consistently good he's not a podium good like he was last year so i i yeah i mean it's not going to surprise me if he walks away with a sprint pursuit back-to-back win it's not going to surprise me if he wins the mass start like yeah none of this obviously is going to surprise me but it also would not surprise me if he comes in like second every single race and mm-hmm. there just happens to be another winner out there. So yeah, I like, I like three and four as that first, uh, as that, that prediction for Johannes Tengis, who is the fighter that we, that he should fear or that, you know, we as biathlon fans should look out for um, anyone else in that, that top 10 who looks like they're going to have the, the right day, the right week at the right time. I think um, on the men's side, Jacamel has the potential. So if it's not a great day for everyone else and he has a really good day, definitely has the potential. And he's shown us that in uh, rope holding, especially. I think like we talked about with Seb Samuelson, you know, on a, any given day, he could be the best athlete in the world. I do like, just Estrello and the individual, if he shoots clean and a couple other athletes miss a target or two, I think he's got a strong chance. I think on the men's side, it's definitely a lot more open than we've seen in previous years. And you know, like our performances in fantasy biathlon could tell you, we obviously have no idea what's going to happen. <laughs> so we're, just, we're, we're just throwing darts at names here with our best guess. But I think there's a lot more possibilities this year than we've seen in previous years. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Giacomel is an interesting one because he's sort of like in that same boat as, as Hecky gross that it's like, it's almost a matter of time until he does get that first win, but it's not as, as sure thing because on the men's side, the Norwegians are so dominant. Like even as we saw in Rupe holding on a day where he has a great performance, almost perfect performance, someone's just going to sneak right there and there and, you know, get right in front of him. So, um, yeah, I like, I like Gio Kamel. I think he is also another one who's actually peaking at the right time. It seems like he's, he's coming around. His form is, he's coming up. Um, yeah, I honestly, for me, I like Tarje Bo. Um, I, I actually, I kind of liked him last week. Uh, I started thinking of him maybe, could he dethrone Johannes Tingis and win the overall? Imagine if, you know, Tarje <laughs> wins the overall this year. Um, and then uh, I was going to say not a super great weekend with a second in the, in the individual and a sixth in the mass start. He actually loses a spot to Johannes Dale. Um, but I like Tarje Bo. I think he's, again, he's just looking at his results, super consistent. Aside from his very first race of the year with 26th place, He's had great performances all season. And quite honestly, I think he probably averages a higher rank than Johannes this year. No. Okay. So Johannes's average rank is 5.6 and Tarje's average rank this year is 6.4. So just barely behind Johannes Tingis. So yeah, I mean, if we're putting Johannes at a potential four wins, I like Bo for a potential four wins and, and honestly, I like him as a potential four or five, you know, medals, not maybe not wins, but medals total. Like, I think it's very possible for him. And then we flip over to the women's side. We don't have that, you know, dominant person on the women's side, but we have a good race going on over here. And, and we'll talk about that in a little bit. And crazy. We haven't even talked about that yet. Um, who on the women's side is going to have, are we going to have someone just absolutely clean up like Roysland at the Olympics? 
and uh, I, I don't think we really had someone clean up last year at World Champs, but are we going to have someone step head and shoulders above the rest, or do you think it's going to be a pretty uh, pretty good fight the whole week? I think it's going to be a pretty good fight the whole week. You know, that's kind of been the narrative on the women's side this whole season. Um, if I had to pick one woman that I think is maybe going to get a few more medals and uh, then a couple of the other athletes, I'm probably going to say Lisa Vitozzi just because I think she's the most complete biathlete across all the um, different disciplines. She's been in the fight for the overall before. Um, she's kind of the one that's been at this high level the longest it feels like looking at the names that are around her in the overall and you know i think i don't think on went as well as she would have hoped with it being her home venue but maybe with a little bit less pressure coming off training at altitude for a while she's who i would probably pick if i had to pick one and then to go back to the our conversation a few seconds ago with who do we fear um Honestly, on the women's side, going down all the way to 17th overall and Anna Maria Lampich, I think anyone <laughs> from 1 to 17, I would be kind of scared of because they could, we've seen Anna Magnuson get a, um, who was it Magnuson or Brosen that got a podium last uh, week Brosen. or this week? Brosen. Brosen. Week, okay. Yeah. But still, Anna Magnuson's gotten, got a podium last year, at least one I remember. Um, and Lampich is skiing a whole percent faster than the next fastest woman, which is crazy. But I think the women's side is wide open and I wouldn't be surprised if, you know, however many individual races there are, if we saw that many different winners and that many different, you know, podium combinations, but every single race I know is going to be exciting. Yeah. I, I'm actually really looking forward to it. I, Man, could you imagine Anna Maria Lampich is she is a case study in herself right now. She is, like you said, so fast, probably one of the fastest we've ever seen compared to the field. But um she, Ethan, is the worst shooter, dead last DFL, worst shooter on the World Cup right now. Fastest and worst. <laughs> uh she's so still 17th. And she's still 17th overall. So that just goes to show you ski speed wins biathlon races. But, um, you know, it, uh, she, she and herself is a uh, fascinating, um, case study that probably deserves a YouTube video at some point, but, um, hopefully if she can win at world champs or something, that would be miraculous. And then that'll, (laughs) that'll inspire me to, to make a video diving a little bit more into her details. But yeah, no, I agree. I think, uh, if, yeah anyone in the top 10 could be i mean hannah oiberg we haven't seen her at all this year she's ranked what is she currently ranked uh 13th we haven't seen her at all uh, this year and she's another person who like last season can come alive at the right time and come away with a couple medals after having literally literally four top 10s all year a third place in one of the first races and that's it so yeah it's gonna be it's going to be super exciting. Um, yeah, this is this is going to be fun. Mm-hmm. All right, let's stay on this thread here. Spare round, looking at the scores. We have pretty much, we have four women, five women with Elvira. And I think you need to include Lou Jamino. <laughs> we have six women. And if you're going to include Lou Jamino, you might as well continue to include Lena Hegegeroyz. And then Preuss hasn't gotten a fair shake. So we have eight women, Ethan, who I think realistically still have a shot at winning the overall. Who do you have? I mean, this list seems like seems like it gets bigger every single week. Um, it was like <laughs> just last week or two weeks ago, we were talking about four women. Now it's eight. It just this topic just keeps getting harder and harder to discuss. And I could just close my eyes and pick a random one, and you know, that's as good of a guess as you could have. But oh man, and, I'm and gonna I, go honestly, with. At this point, I can't even remember who I picked at the beginning of the season. 
because uh, I'm just like, I'm impressed by all these women. I think they all have the opportunity mm-hmm. and the ability to do it, and they've all proven that this year. All right, who, who, who are you going to say? I think I'm going to stick with Lisa Vitozzi. Mm. I think just because, like I said before, she's been here, done it, competing with um, Vera a couple of years ago for the overall. I think she has the most experience competing at the top. Um, to top of every race than some of these other women. Um, I think she's able to just put it together a little more consistently. Obviously, she's in third right now, so obviously not as consistent as like Tanner Vald and Brizza Boucher, but over the course of her career, I think she's been able to put it together more consistently. And I think one factor that might play into her benefit is that Soldier Hollow and Canmore, the last two World Cups, are at altitude. And living and training at altitude and on tolts is, you know, there's a reason that she lives there and so many athletes go and train there and spend time at altitude. And if it pays off for her, it could pay off in a big way. Yeah, I agree. And and it's funny you say that because I was going to pick Justine Brazard Boucher for that exact same reason. Um, I think Tandervold is going to face some pressure at Oslo after world champs. I think the pressure is off for Lisa Vitozzi, um, but I just, I like Justine. Looking at the last couple of races of the season here um, for the, you know, for the points scoring, that is, um, obviously we have world champs, and then after world champs, we have an individual to finish out that in Oslo, mass start. I like, um, I like Breza Boucher for that, sprint pursuit, and Soldier mm-hmm. Hollow, Sprint Pursuit, Mass Start to finish out the point scoring. So a um, lot of fun head-to-head racing for the rest of the season. And also at altitude on courses that I think really suit uh, someone like Justine. So um, they actually remind me, those courses do remind me a lot of, of Lenzerheide, where it's just kind of like long, straightaway, just climbs. And yeah, the... Uh, Anholt's a little bit more turny, um, a little bit more like technical of a course where I think on, I think Canmore and, and Soldier Hollow are going to be a little bit more like, uh, like Lanzerheide. And we saw that Justine did well at Lanzerheide. So I'm going to go with Justine and, uh, looks like you're going with Lisa. So we'll see. (laughs) All right, everyone. Thanks so much for listening. We really appreciate it. And like I said, if you could leave us a review on Spotify and head over to YouTube, find this episode on YouTube and let's keep the conversation going. There's always a pretty decent conversation there. And I try to reply to most of the comments um, if I see them and they're good (laughs) contributors to the conversation. But um, yeah, until next time, we'll see you.